Last week, we started to work on the Nintendo Hire Me Crypto or Keegan Challenge, and we basically just spent time trying to understand the algorithm and thinking about ways how we might be able to attack it. So if you want a bit more context, feel free to watch that other video first. Otherwise, we will now go and solve it with math. So remember when I tried to visualize this XOR loop in the code with this drawing here? Basically showing that each byte of the input array is the result of XORing multiple outbytes. But which outbytes get XORed is selected by this bit mask? Well, what made it click for me was when I decided to write down the same information differently. Changing the way how I present this information to myself helps me to find a solution. And I think this is a huge takeaway. I didn't get magically smarter. I just tried to approach the same thing from a different angle. I didn't know that it would help me for the solution, but in the end, it's what made my brain click. So long story short, what did I do? I decided to write down one part of the algorithm in a function notation like in math class. I started from the end of the algorithm again. And as we know, a byte in the out array is the result of XORing two values. Call it P and Q for now. And the next value in out is the result of XORing R and S. Of course, the out array is longer, but it's just an example. All right, so how is P, Q, R and S calculated? This is just an example, it's not the real values, but P is calculated by XORing different out values selected by the bit shifting diffusion expression. So for example, it might take the first out byte, XOR it with the second and the third. And now Q has a different selection of out bytes. It might not include the first out byte, so maybe it's XORing the second and the third one. And now R could include the first out byte, but not the second, but include the third again. And what I saw now blew my mind. I wonder if anybody here now recognizes this, or even recognized this much earlier just by reading the code. I didn't recognize this before. I only recognized it after writing it down like this. What do you see here? This looks like the math you had to learn in like the eighth or ninth grade or so. This looks like a system of linear equations. Imagine it like this, P equal to A plus B plus C, Q equal to B plus C, and R equal to A plus C. This looks like very basic school math, right? If we know the values of capital P, Q and R, then we can solve the system of linear equations to find out the value for the variables A, B and C. Which means, if we know the internal state of the input array, which is basically those values, we should be able to find the values of the out array through high school math. But applying this math efficiently requires a bit more experience than just high school. Or rather, I don't remember when matrix math stuff is taught. Is it in high school or maybe just college? Anyway, there's a very efficient way of solving linear equations using matrices. I found a very simple and clean example of this on this math is fun website. Let's say you want to solve the system of equations. You write it down as a matrix. For example, x, y, and z are there only once, so it's a one, and then x was missing in the second equation, and that's why x was basically multiplied with zero, whatever. You can pattern match, it's simple to translate these equations into this matrix. And like you can rearrange a basic equation, you can rearrange those matrix equations. This is like a times x equal to b, and to find now the values of the unknown x, y, and z, we can rearrange x to one side, and then on the other we have the inverse of a times b. The inverse of a matrix is a bit ugly and annoying to calculate by hand, but computers are really, really good at that stuff. And suddenly, I have a super clear plan, at least for this stage of the algorithm. I simply want to use matrix math to find the out array if I have an input array. Now, I want to reference a video I did quite a while ago about a CTF challenge called Software Update from the 34th C3 CTF, because there my teammate also had to solve a system of linear equations made up of XORs, and they did that with SageMath, which is a computer algebra system built on top of Python. And this was my basis trying to write my own code in Sage. I have never written Sage on my own before. Now, developing this was not straightforward to me because I'm a noob in math. I can reason about it somewhat, taking notes like this, but practically implementing this in code is another beast. From the software update challenge, I learned that the XOR operation acts like the addition operation 
if you are in Galloway Field 2, GF2. Fancy name, watch my other video if you want to know a bit more. Essentially, it just means we live in a world of zero and one. No larger numbers exist. So I somewhat knew that it should work if I restrict the matrix to GF2 because then the plus is equivalent to XOR. I was playing around with code, but it didn't work and I got frustrated and eventually I had to ask my teammates for help. This started a discussion that XOR is not a linear operation, which means you can't solve XOR equations with this method, at least on a byte level. However, my GF2 thought still applied. If I calculate on the bit level, then it works. So essentially, instead of having a matrix or a vector of, for example, three bytes, I need a vector of three times eight, so 24 bits, which means it's not a system of three linear equations, one for each byte. It's a system of 24 linear equations defined for each individual bit. Or in reality, with our 32 bytes, we have a system with 256 single bit equations. And here's my super ugly code for this. This long hex string is actually a test value I've gotten straight from the program. I printed the internal state of input and out before and after the XOR calculation. So this value is the result. And when we solve our system of equation, we expect the output bytes to be this value here. Anyway, this line of Python code is incredibly ugly, but this simply creates a matrix of 32 rows, each row being the bits of one byte. So that's the B matrix, the expected result. Now we need to create the A matrix, which are the ones and zeros from the diffusion array. These integers define which out array elements are XORed and we also extract the 32 bits of those 32 integers. This will create a big matrix. Please note that both matrices are defined over GF2 so that the addition operation is equivalent to the XOR operation. And now we can call solve right on the matrix A with B. This essentially is like the inverse of A times B. You could quite literally also write here, take the inverse of A and multiply it by B. Whatever. Now that we have calculated X, we can go through the rows, which are rows of bits that we can combine to bytes and print them as hex value. And look at the resulting hex values. They are the same as we have seen when executing the program with the debug output. 1C, C6, 2, 4, 2, 3, and so forth. So this worked. This means if we get a candidate for our internal input array, we have now a method to recover the internal state of out. Out was the result of substituting the bytes using the confusion array, which we know we can somewhat reverse. As mentioned in the previous video, there are bytes that cannot be reversed. In that case, we can just reject this guess and try something else. Other bytes have multiple options, which means we get multiple candidates for the input error here. But all of this can be done in a loop of 256 times. So we just have to try to reverse solve these equations. And if we successfully solve 256 equation systems in a row, we find the original input array that we want. Awesome. We are getting really close. Now, I still haven't figured out how to optimize the brute force of the 16 bytes at the start. But once we have a candidate, we have now a way to check if it's our solution. Though I still think that brute forcing those 16 byte candidates will take way too long. But I decided to try it anyway. So how do you brute force those 16 bytes? From the confusion substitution, we know that not every byte can be reversed. So we only include the bytes where we have a reverse. And there are different possible values for even and the odd numbers. You can see that the confusion substitution array is 512 large and when it applies the substitution, then the even indices are taken from 0 to 255 and the odd indices get added an offset of 256. So the odd ones are substituted with the bytes from the 256 to 511th indice. But this is all annoying to do by hand and my solution actually uses Z3. Z3 is a theorem prover or SAT solver and I have used Z3 on this channel before. If you are interested in cracking license key verifications or custom ciphers or stuff like that, Z3 can be a very useful tool and I just use it as a generator of input candidates. It's very simple if you get the hang of it. So let's take a look at my solution. First, I generate a reverse index of the confusion array. I create S1 and S2, which map from a byte back to the potential inputs. The function sbox takes a list of bytes and attempts to reverse them using the S1 mapping. 
it will be used for the substitutions done here. If a byte cannot be reversed, then this returns none, which means whatever we tried to reverse was definitely invalid. Otherwise, we use iterTools.product to return all possible reversals. Remember that some bytes could be reversed to multiple bytes, so we need to make sure we keep track of all possibilities. The input to out function is the magical matrix function, which takes an input candidate and then solves the equation system for y and we return that result. The heart of my solution is solve round, which is a recursive function. It expects to be given a potential input array candidate and then uses input to out to find the internal out values. Once we have that, it's actually not quite the out array because remember it was substituted first, so now we try to reverse the substitution. If it cannot be reversed, then we just ignore this and return none. But if there are valid substitution reversals, then we have to go through all the possible combinations and call recursively solve round. And this recursion has to succeed 256 times. If we call solve round 256 times, the round i will be minus one and the input we have found is in fact the solution. Now this function expects an input key candidate. So how do we get those? And this is where we get to set three. We are basically looking for the last internal input array that results into the higher me string. We are basically looking for the last internal input array that results into the higher me string that can be reversed using the matrix equations solved 256 times. So this is where we prepare the set three bit vectors to be our input candidate. Now comes the real set three magic. We are adding an equation to set three based on our target string. We are saying the first letter here, capital H, is the result of XORing two input bytes. Just FYI, in case you are confused about this operation, we are using Sage here. So it's a bit weird Python. Usually a single carré is XOR in Python, but that is the power two in Sage and XOR is now a double carré. Anyway, by adding these constraints, we can tell Z3 to give us valid values for input that satisfy this equation which means we only get selections that are valid, selections that can be XORed to get higher me. But there are more constraints we can add because the values that are XORed are the substitution result. So we need to make sure those input bytes can be reversed. So here I'm looping over the reverse substitution list and if a byte is not included in S1 for the even or S2 for the odd indices, then we are adding a constraint that the input at a given index must not be that value. With that setup of constraints, we can now let set three solve those constraints and when it finds candidates in the model, we can use the byte as a potential valid input array. But again, not quite. We know the input bytes were also substituted, so we need to find all possible reverse substitutions and loop over all options. Here we don't need to check if it can be reversed because we added the constraint earlier. So Z3 only will generate input candidates that can be reversed. Anyway, here we kick off the true solution. Given our very good input candidates, we now call the recursive function solve round. If this returns not none, and returns an actual value, we know we reached a depth of 256 reversed rounds and we have the solution that we can print. So let's run it. This will actually take a while. It maybe takes like 15 to 30 minutes to brute force, but it works and it will find a solution. By the way, in case you are wondering what I'm using here, this is a Jupyter notebook and when you install SageMath, it comes bundled with it. If you start the Sage Notebook, then you will get this web interface. It's really awesome for CTF stuff. And if you need to install additional Python packages for this, you can use this snippet to pip install other Python modules in the context of Sage. Anyway, I just forward to the end. Here's the solution. And if we now copy those bytes into the hire me source code as the input, we should have solved it. So let's compile it again and run it. And there we go. We get the output hire me and the exit code is now also the expected zero. I hope you can take something away from how I approached this harder challenge. I learned a lot new stuff from doing this. I've never used Sage before and doing this kind of math is also not something I'm good at. But I think it's fascinating how this complex looking algorithm can be boiled down to relatively basic math that you would learn if you study computer science in university. The actual difficulty is then just to recognize that this is even such a math problem. As you have seen, it also took me a while until I realized that. 
And that's why learning fundamentals and why math is so important. Real world IT or programming problems often boil down to the same principles and can be expressed and solved with standard math tools. Anyway, I'm still curious if there are faster ways to solve this because mine is quite slow. Spoiler alert, yes, there is. So if you find a better solution, please create the detailed write-up that dummies like me can understand. Or maybe I will have to make another video about it.